Welcome to the online lecture on the science of lactation and the physiology of breastfeeding. By the end of this session, the student will be able to describe the developmental phases of the mammary glands and also key factors influencing the establishment and maintenance of milk production. So before I get started, I just want to stress a couple key concepts that are really important about this lecture. A couple concepts I want to stress before we start this lecture. This particular topic, the science of lactation, we get much more technical than many other topics, and that's because it is so critical to promoting breastfeeding in the community. One of the biggest barriers to women initiating breastfeeding as well as continuing to breastfeed is their fear that their body will not produce enough breast milk. A lot of women do not have the confidence in the ability to exclusively breastfeed their baby. It comes from a variety of inaccurate myths, misperceptions regarding what it takes to make milk. And so if you do choose to go out in the community and promote breastfeeding to women and their families, having a solid understanding that's backed with evidence and science in terms of what it really does take to produce a good milk supply is key. We're starting off first discussing the development phases of the mammary gland. So in order to educate families in the community about breast milk production, it's important to have a sense of how the breasts develop to produce milk. And so we're going to talk about the phases of breast development, which begins in mammo with mammogenesis, then lactogenesis 1, 2, 3, sometimes called galactopoiesis, and then also involution. Before we get started with the developmental phases of the mammary gland, I want to touch a little bit about the early growth and development of the mammary glands. The mammary glands actually begin to develop in the fetal period as early as the fourth or fifth week of gestation for both males and females. Not a whole lot of development that we see both in the male and female in childhood. Now we're going to talk about mammogenesis, which is the first phase of breast development in terms of preparing the body for lactation. And that begins with the onset of puberty and ends at about the beginning of the second trimester of pregnancy. During puberty, there is a lot of breast tissue development that occurs and it only occurs in the female. And we see a lot of changes in the functional breast tissue. Remember the functional breast tissue is the breast tissue that aids later with lactation. And we see a lot of changes in, that are occurring with the onset of the first period. And typically by about a year to a year and a half um, after the first period, those changes have been complete. We don't see a whole lot of changes in the non-pregnant adult. The only thing that happens is every time the mom has, right before she gets her period, there might be some breast fullness and that's because the body is preparing for pregnancy, but once the woman gets her period and there is no pregnancy, breasts go back to where they were before. There are a lot of changes that we see during the first trimester of pregnancy. And again, these are hormonally driven changes that are the body preparing for pregnancy. So in puberty, we see a lot of changes in the female breasts. And these major changes occur right after the first period and typically are complete by 12 to 18 months after the onset of menses. We don't see a whole lot of changes in the non-pregnant adult. Um, mammary glands are relatively inactive from 12 to 18 months after the onset of puberty up until pregnancy. There are some minor changes that occur. The breast might be slightly fuller around 12, 16 days before the onset of each menses until the end of the menstrual cycle and that's basically the body is preparing to be pregnant but if the woman gets her period and the woman isn't pregnant the breasts go back to an inactive state. Once the mom becomes pregnant there are a lot of changes in breast development and those are all triggered by the hormones of pregnancy so we'll see some darkening of the areola, the nipple getting larger, the Montgomery glands becoming more pimply and beginning to secrete an oily substance. We'll see the duct system multiplying. And these are all changes that are occurring to prepare the body for lactation or specifically the breasts. The woman is in her second trimester, around 14 weeks of pregnancy is when we'll enter lactogenesis one. Lactogenesis one is when the body begins to make colostrum. And so this particular phase is um, controlled by the endocrine system. And for those of you who don't know, the endocrine system is a collection of glands that produce hormones and regulate all sorts of functions, including growth and development and reproduction. 
And why I'm stressing that this is hormonally driven is it's important to keep in mind that regardless of what the woman has decided she'll do with respect to how she'll feed her infant, if she wants to formula feed, her body doesn't care. The body is pregnant and it is in that second trimester preparing for lactation. The hormones are preparing the body to breastfeed. And so we'll see that the body starts to actually produce colostrum. Some women may leak a little bit, not everyone. And whether or not there is leakage of colostrum has nothing to do with how much milk the woman produces. But at this time, the woman is actually producing colostrum. For those of you who don't know, colostrum is actually um, the first milk that comes in the first few days of life. We'll talk a little bit more about colostrum and how it's different than mature milk. But for right now, what I want you to know is that during lactogenesis one, about that 16th week of pregnancy, the body is already producing colostrum. This particular stage is referred to as secretory differentiation, and that's because the alveoli in the breast differentiate into secretory cells for milk production, and they can make milk. So remember, the alveoli are those milk-making cells, and in lactogenesis one, they're producing colostrum. The next phase of mammary development is lactogenesis two. And this also is controlled by the endocrine system and hormonally driven does not matter if the mom is choosing to breastfeed or not. And it is triggered by the delivery of the baby in the placenta. Once the baby's born and the placenta has been delivered, there are uh, some changes in the hormones that let the body know baby is here. We need to start to produce mature milk. And so some of those things, those hormones that occur is that the progesterone rapidly drops. Progesterone is a hormone that helps with the maintenance of pregnancy. Once the baby's here, the body doesn't need all that progesterone. So those levels drop substantially and prolactin increases rapidly and substantially. And then the milk volume increases. This typically occurs around three to eight days postpartum. And this particular stage is referred to secretory activation because the alveoli begin to secrete large volumes of milk. This is also the time that the colostrum phase ends, meaning the body stops to produce colostrum and starts to um, produce transitional milk. This is a great time to show you what breast milk looks like. So. Uh, this slide shows you what colostrum looks like, mature milk looks like, and transitional milk. And so you can see colostrum is much more yellow than mature milk. Mature milk has more of a white kind of opaque look. And transitional milk is essentially the mixture of the two. Colostrum is what the body is making during lactogenesis 1. Typically, lactogenesis 2, we start to see some of that transitional milk and most likely by day nine or so, we might see some mature milk. Although lactogenesis two is triggered by the delivery of the baby in the placenta, there are some factors that can delay lactogenesis two or impair it completely. And we're not gonna go into details about each of these conditions for our purposes for right now. I just want you to be aware of some of those factors that can delay lactogenesis too. So those include fluid volume overload during labor, so a lot of IV fluids during labor, C-section, very stressful vaginal birth with a long stage two labor. So sometimes women may be in labor for a very, very long time and spend stage two, if you don't know, is when the mother is pushing the baby out. So if it's very stressful or long, that can delay lactogenesis too, meaning the milk may not come in as quickly uh, type 1 diabetes, obesity, history of uh, reduction mammoplasty, which is basically breast reduction surgery that can um, sever a lot of the milk ducts and can make it, um, can impair lactogenesis too. We also see that if the mother has hypoplasia, which is underdeveloped breast tissue, which we're going to talk about shortly, that can significantly impair lactogenesis too polycystic ovarian syndrome, infertility, thyroid dysfunction, Cheyenne syndrome, and retained placental fragments. So, you know, for those of you who don't know, Cheyenne syndrome is actually a condition that the mother's blood pressure may drop substantially right after birth. And um, at that time, blood does not get to the pituitary gland, and then there is permanent damage to the pituitary gland. 
and as you'll see shortly when we discuss the hormones that are essential for breast milk production, you'll see that the pituitary gland secretes two hormones that are critical for lactation. and so if that pituitary gland is no longer functioning that will impair lactogenesis too significantly retained placental fragments. we just mentioned that what triggers lactogenesis too is the delivery of the placenta. if there's even just a tiny bit of placental fragments still inside that uterus or on that uterine wall that body thinks the mom is still pregnant and will not start to produce mature milk. the next phase we'll briefly touch on is lactogenesis three or galactopoiesis and this is the most important phase with return with respect to understanding what it takes to build a good milk supply and get breastfeeding off to a good start. so we talked about how lactogenesis one and two are hormonally driven. if the mom is pregnant they're going to happen. you know lactogenesis one about the second trimester if mom's pregnant in most cases her body will make colostrum. lactogenesis two once that baby's born deliverer of the placenta the body's going to start to stop making colostrum make transitional milk and go into mature milk. breasts are going to get full milk is going to come in. in order to get to lactogenesis three or galactopoiesis which is also described or considered the establishment of lactation the mom and the baby need to be involved. so mom needs to be breastfeeding that baby frequently and the baby needs to be effectively breastfeeding and removing milk from the breast. this particular stage or phase is autokin control. it's driven by local control not hormones. it's all about supply and demand. the supply is in influenced by the infant's demand the more the baby wants the more the mom feeds the more likely she's going to establish lactation and it's really critical that the breastfeeding is effective and that it's frequent and that breast milk is removed effectively from the breast. so if the baby's latched on well but they're not transferring milk or effectively removing milk from the breast we're not going to get to galactopoiesis if the mom is uh, stretching the feedings and not feeding the baby frequently we often referred to as mismanagement of breastfeeding we're not going to get to galactopoiesis if the mom's supplementing with a lot of formula and there's not effective and frequent removal of breast milk again we're not going to reach galactopoiesis and if the mom gets a good start to breastfeeding and the baby's again effectively and frequently removing milk from the breast this phase occurs about nine days postpartum, postpartum and lasts all the way through weaning. so let me just quickly test your knowledge about the stages of breast development. i just want to know of these three stages that are on this slide lactogenesis one, lactogenesis two, and galactopoiesis which ones are triggered by the endocrine system that is the hormones and which ones are not which ones are triggered by the autocrine system. take a few moments I want you to write down on a piece of paper which your answers are and then turn the video back on. so if you said that lactogenesis one and two are controlled by the endocrine system you are correct and if you said galactopoiesis is not because it's controlled by the autocrine system you're correct. Now let's talk about the specific factors that influence the establishment and continued production of milk. so what does it take to get to galactopoiesis? because again um, if a mom is pregnant and she doesn't know if she wants to breastfeed or not her body most cases will go through lactogenesis one and two but she does need to be actively involved in order for her to get to galactopoiesis or her breast to get mammary glands to develop into that phase. there are three things I want to talk about in terms of the key factors that impact galactopoiesis. one is breast stimulation and frequent and effective milk removal. the other is sufficient glandular tissue and the last is sufficient intact nerve wave pathways in milk ducts. so um, on this slide the first one breast stimulation and frequent effective milk removal is in for the most part the control of the mom and her health behavior. if she's actively engaged in breastfeeding her child it's going to be likely that she's going to be successful at stimulating the baby to breastfeed and to frequently remove 
milk from the breast. If the baby's not effective at feeding, she can use a breast pump. But in terms of sufficient glandular tissue and sufficient intact nerveway pathways in milk ducts, that's not in the mother's control. Sufficient glandular tissue, genetically the mom may have been born with insufficient glandular tissue, not a whole lot she can do about that. And if she's had some injury or some surgery that has damaged her nerve pathways in the milk ducts, that's also something that's not completely in her control to fix. So let's talk about the first of those. What happens when the breast is stimulated? And so in order to understand um, this, I want to go into some explanation about the hormones that are involved in milk production. This is a great slide that shows what happens. This is essentially the physiology of lactation. Um, so you can see there is this baby here that is sucking at the breast. Now when the baby sucks at the breast, there is a message that goes all the way up to the brain through the nerve pathways to the hypothalamus where that pituitary gland is. And the message tells the brain, hello, there is a baby that is hungry here. And the pituitary gland releases two hormones, oxytocin and prolactin. And um, oxytocin is responsible for the milk ejection reflex and it releases milk from the alveoli to the baby. And prolactin is responsible for making milk, telling the body to make more milk. And um, also oxytocin is responsible for uterine contraction. So you can see here, uh, oxytocin brings the milk to the baby and it also causes contractions in the uterus. Now, why is that important? Well, when the mom is not pregnant, the uterus is about the size of a grapefruit, maybe even smaller. And once she has her baby, that uterus has enlarged to at least bigger than her baby because it has been nourishing that baby and during that whole pregnancy. And we need to get that uterus back to the pre-pregnancy state. What does that is contractions. And um, if the mom's uterus does not get back to that pre-pregnancy state, she's at risk for postpartum hemorrhaging. And so um, every time the mom breastfeeds, there is a release of oxytocin and that triggers the uterus to contract and it helps it come back more quickly to that pre-pregnancy state. And so that is one of the reasons why breastfeeding helps prevent postpartum hemorrhaging. So let's talk about this in greater detail. So first let's talk about prolactin. Um, so let's talk a bit about prolactin. So I just mentioned that prolactin is responsible during lactation for the production and ongoing production of milk. However, I do want you to know that during pregnancy, prolactin does have a role. It actually stimulates alveolar growth. Alveoli are the milk making cells. Um, after birth, that is what triggers lactogenesis too. Remember when the baby's delivered and the placenta is delivered, drop in progesterone and whoosh, surge of prolactin, which triggers lactogenesis too. Throughout lactation, prolactin tells the body to produce milk. And um, one nice thing about prolactin is it's a natural tranquilizer and it relaxes the mom and also is known to induce maternal behavior. Oxytocin, the other hormone that's responsible for lactation and milk production, um, is triggered by nipple stimulation, so is prolactin during lactation. And um, when oxytocin is released, as I mentioned earlier, it does result in the milk ejection reflex. So as you may remember from the anatomy lecture, the myoepithelial cells, that's that contractile unit right around those alveoli or the milk making cells, when um, oxytocin is released, they compress around that milk making cell and push milk down the ducts, out the nipple into the baby. Um, milk ejection occurs in both breasts. So even though the baby might be breastfeeding on the right breast, when their oxytocin is released, there will be a letdown in both breasts, so the mom may experience leaking on the breast where the baby is not breastfeeding. And um, it also triggers uterine contraction, which as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, helps shrink the uterus back to its pre-pregnancy size and control postpartum bleeding. Um, in addition to nipple stimulation, when the baby is breastfeeding, triggering oxytocin, there are some other stimuli that can trigger oxytocin, and that includes sight, smell, sound, and touch. And so this is important to know because 
for example, sometimes women, when they go back to work and they're pumping for their baby, they have a difficulty letting down. It's really easy to have a let down when the baby is stimulating your reps. The pump's not as effective. And so if the mom is pumping and she's pumping for 10 minutes and she's getting hardly anything, just droplets, what can help is to stimulate the oxytocin or that letdown reflex with different stimuli, like for example, sight a photo of her baby, or maybe a video on her phone of the baby, a smell of her baby blanket, or the sound of her baby, again, watching a video, seeing and hearing her baby touch is a little bit of massage. So um, oxytocin can be stimulated by other triggers. It also does a couple of other things for moms. It's very beneficial because it reduces blood pressure, cortisol levels, which reduce stress. It can increase pain threshold. And like um, prolactin, it can induce maternal behavior. It's actually referred to as a mothering hormone. Oxytocin uh, can be inhibited by a couple things like stress, fear, and pain. So while positive uh, emotions and sensations can increase the release of oxytocin, negative emotions and physical stressors can inhibit it. So if the mom is, for example, in a lot of pain, she's breastfeeding and it's really hurting, she's gonna have difficulty having a let down and the milk won't come down as a result of that if she's really scared. So again, thinking about the mother who's pumping, if she's pumping at work and she's really worried she's gonna get in trouble or her coworkers will be mad, she may not be able to have many letdowns during that pumping session and she's not gonna get as much milk during um, the amount of time she's pumping. So again, we're talking about what happens when there is frequent and effective milk removal. And in order to have a good solid understanding of what happens and why it is necessary for moms to frequently feed the baby and for that baby to effectively remove milk in order for them to build a good milk supply, we're gonna have a discussion of prolactin receptor theory and feedback inhibitor of lactation. So prolactin receptor theory is basically a theory that what we've found is that frequent and effective removal of milk during the first three weeks is associated with uh, more, more and also more sensitive prolactin receptors. And so um, remember, prolactin is the hormone that tells the body to make milk. If the mom feeds very frequently and the baby is effectively removing milk from the breast in the what we call the critical period, the first few weeks, her body will make more prolactin receptors and they'll be more sensitive and they will tell the body to make more milk, make more milk. And um, so the theory is that the more prolactin receptors in the breast, the more sensitive the prolactin receptors are, the greater potential for breast milk production. And that's why we stress that women um, get a good start to breastfeeding. Supplementation of formula in the early days, that first few two weeks can make it much more challenging for moms to build a good milk supply because they won't have many prolactin receptors and their prolactin receptors won't be so sensitive. So they'll have difficulty making more milk. Um, the other thing that's important to be knowledgeable about in terms of why it's so important to um, remove milk from the breast is uh, an understanding of what feedback inhibitor of lactation is, also known as fill. So fill is a wheat protein that naturally occurs in the breast milk. And when the breasts become full, the amount of fill increases and it slows down production. So basically the body has a way to calibrate milk production. If the mom feeds the baby frequently and the baby is effectively removing milk from the breast, the body knows there's someone here who needs all that milk. Make, the more the baby eats, the more the mom makes. But if the mom skips a feeding, she supplements, and her breasts are getting full, as a result of the baby not removing the amount of milk they need, there's a message to the body, look, you know what? This baby doesn't need as much as we thought. Let's start to reduce production. And that's what Phil does. And um, if the mom is frequently and effectively removing milk from the breast, there is not an accumulation of Phil. Here's a great picture explaining the difference between an emptier breast and a full breast in terms of Phil. So over here on the left, you can see 
it's not an empty breast, it's just a breast that the baby is eating frequently as it should. Um, and you can see the green here, that's the prolactin receptors. A lot of prolactin receptors telling the body to make milk. Very little fill because the breasts are not full. And there's a message to the brain and to the body, hey, you know what, the amount of milk we're making is right on. Here in this fuller breast where perhaps the mother skipped a feeding, she fed the baby formula, and so her breasts are getting fuller. And what's happening, these blue dots represent fill. There is this more and more fill accumulating the breast. And here the prolactin receptors, they're being squished by the full breast and they're um, distorted and then they're not as effective at telling the body to make milk. So really important for the mom, especially in the critical period, to frequently and effectively remove milk from the breast so she creates a lot of prolactin receptors and important to frequently remove milk from the breast so that the breasts do not get accumulated with fill and tell the body to make less milk. Instead, they'll tell the body, make, keep making, keep making, keep making. The next um, component that's important to understand in terms of galactopoiesis is um, sufficient glandular tissue and milk production. So in order for the mom to make adequate amounts of milk for that baby, so if I want to exclusively breastfeed for my child, I need to have sufficient glandular tissue. Without sufficient glandular tissue, I'm not going to be able to make sufficient amounts and I won't be able to exclusively breastfeed my baby. In most cases, if the mom is frequently feeding the baby and the baby is effectively removing milk from the breast, she's going to hit galactopoiesis and establish a great milk supply. But in rare cases, the mom may have something called hypoplasia, which is a condition that's characterized by insufficient glandular tissue. There are some physical characteristics that uh, you can see here on this slide that are characteristic of hypoplasia. So you see the slide on the right hand here has widely spaced breasts. They're tubular cone shaped and then um, the areola is bobulous looking. In addition to the physical signs, some other ways that we identify women with insufficient glandular tissue is that they do not report breast changes during pregnancy. And as you may recall from the lecture on anatomy, Typically, women will see a lot of changes in their breasts, including an increase in size during pregnancy. If a mom sees no changes whatsoever in terms of the size of her breasts or the areola darkening, more pronounced Montgomery tubules, that's a red flag that this woman may have insufficient glandular tissue and definitely warrants a visit to the lactation consultant so that she could have a take a look and also make sure that this woman if she is interested in breastfeeding, be followed by a lactation consultant. It's difficult to know how much milk a woman who has insufficient glandular tissue will produce. There's different gradations of insufficient glandular tissue. So it's best that if a mother is concerned, if she hasn't noticed any changes in her breasts at pregnancy, she is followed from the get-go because we want to make sure that that baby gains sufficient weight. Because if a mom doesn't know that she's at risk for not producing adequate amounts of milk from her for her baby, she may think that, oh, I'm feeding the baby frequently and it looks like the baby's effective. And lo and behold, she comes for that two week visit, uh, follow up visit once the baby's born. The pediatrician says, look, you know what? This baby has failure to thrive. The baby has not gained back its birth weight and is losing a lot of weight. That's not very fun for a mom. The best way to prevent that is connect her to a lactation consultant right at birth and have her know about this issue before baby is born. Another factor that's important to building a good milk supply and um, establishing lactation is having enough intact nerve pathways and milk ducts. If the mom does not have enough nerve pathways that are intact, or intact milk ducts, she's not going to be able to um, exclusively breastfeed that baby. And some things that can cause damage to the nerve pathways include surgeries to the breast or injuries that sever the nerves and affect milk production. So if there is a mom who has had a prior breast surgery it's uh, or an injury to the breast, so that can include something like a burn victim who's had a third degree burn to the breast, that would sever nerves. And remember, in order for 
the hormones of prolactin and oxytocin to be released from the pituitary gland, there needs to be um, stimulation of the nipple and the message goes up through those nerve pathways. If the nerve pathways are damaged, that message is not gonna get to the brain and those hormones will not be released, making it difficult for the milk to come down to the breast because of oxytocin and then the body to make more milk due to prolactin. So under these circumstances, just like um, insufficient glandular tissue, we would want to have the mother um, be seen by a lactation consultant from the get-go right at birth and so she could have the baby monitor. What's done actually in these situations is test weighing. When we follow the mother closely to assess milk supply, the mom would weigh, have the baby weighed on a very, very precise scale, feed the baby, and then retest weight the baby. And then the difference between number that the baby weighed before the feeding and after would tell the lactation consultant and the mother how much breast milk that baby got. And that would help the lactation consultant and the mom develop a plan based on how much milk is this mom producing? Do we need to supplement? And if so, how much? But in any case, when there is not sufficient nerve pathways and milk ducts or insufficient glandular tissue, definitely important to bring the lactation consultant in to work with that mom. So in order to get to galactopoiesis, key strategies to establishing milk production or a good milk supply and maintaining it is frequent removal of breast milk from the breast. So you've heard this over and over again in this lecture, but it is the key to establishing and maintaining a good milk supply. So when we're talking about frequent removal of breast milk from the breast with the babies that are newborns till three or four months, they need to be eating at least eight to 12 times in 24 hours. That's very frequent. It's about an hour and a half, every hour and a half to three hours. Also, in order to make sure that babies are frequently eating enough to establish a good milk supply, moms need to avoid all artificial nipples. So that includes pacifiers and bottles. In terms of pacifiers, babies like to suck. If they're doing a lot of their sucking on a pacifier, they may satisfy some of that sucking need and then they're not going to breastfeed as frequently. The other reason moms want to avoid artificial nipples, both bottles and pacifiers, babies suck differently on a pacifier and on a bottle and that can make them not suck as effectively on the breast. And remember, we need sufficient stimulation when they're um, at the breast. So they could be frequently at the breast, but they're not suckling effectively. So that can um, make it more difficult and prevent good milk supply. Also avoiding unnecessary supplements. If I supplement with formula and I skip one of those eight feedings in 24 hours, my baby's not going to be suckling at the breast frequently enough to establish a good milk supply. So again, frequent removal of breast milk with the breast. Another key strategy for establishing and maintaining a good milk supply is effective removal of breast milk from the breast. So a baby may be at the breast frequently they may even have a good latch, but if they're not effectively removing milk from the breast, then that mom will not establish a good milk supply. And so that baby may be frequently at the breast, maybe has a good latch, but they're not effectively removing breast milk from the breast, then that's gonna be an issue and the mom won't establish a good milk supply. If the mom notices that the baby is not effectively removing breast milk from the breast, she can use a breast pump in lieu of the baby and that would help her establish a good milk supply. The other thing that helps with establishing and maintaining a good milk supply is frequent skin to skin contact. The last phase of breast development is involution and that's when the breast returns to its pre-pregnancy state. So this typically occurs about 40 days after the last breastfeeding. And once the breast milk is no longer being removed from the breast, what happens to the epithelial cells is cell death. And so we go all the way back to how the breasts were um, initially during that mammogenesis phase. Um, every time the mom gets pregnant and lactates, the breasts will go through those phases of breast development with the ultimate goal of preparing for lactation. So let's test your knowledge about the characteristics listed below. As I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, it's really important for folks who are promoting breastfeeding in the community to have a solid understanding of what it takes to establish a good milk supply. 
And so I really want you to be familiar with each of the phases that I talked about and what their ma the main characteristics of, about each phase. So when they occur, you know, does it occur in the first trimester, the second trimester? Um, what are the key characteristics that occur? When does the body make colostrum? When does the body stop making colostrum? Which of the phases are triggered by hormones, etc.? So let's test your knowledge. So um, which phase of mammary gland development occurs during puberty and early pregnancy? I want you to close the video, write down which phase it is, and then turn it back on. That's correct, mammogenesis. You know, what about which phase occurs nine days postpartum? Again, turn off the video, write down your answer, and turn the video back on. That's correct, galactopoiesis. How about the phase that occurs 40 days after the last breastfeeding? Turn off the video or pause it, and then turn it back on once you have written down your response. That's correct, involution. Which phase occurs two to eight days postpartum? Again, stop the video momentarily, write down your response, and then turn it back on. That's correct, lactogenesis two. Which one occurs from mid-pregnancy to two days postpartum? That's correct, lactogenesis one. A couple more, how about when does the body begin to make colostrum? That's right, lactogenesis one. How about which phase is referred to as secretory epithelial cells, epitoesis, or cell death? That's correct, involution. Which phase is when milk production is established? That's right, lactogenesis three or galactopoiesis. When does the body begin to secrete large amounts of milk? And this particular phase is referred to as secretory activation. You got it, lactogenesis two. I also would like to test your knowledge on pulling together some of the information that we discussed. So I would like you to read this scenario, turn off or pause the online lecture, decide what the correct answer is, and then turn it back on. That's correct, C. So in this case, we have a mom, Stephanie, who's postpartum seven days, and she calls a breastfeeding warm line. She's very concerned because her breasts are not feeling full. And typically, three days after babies are born, we should have lactogenesis two occurring, breast fullness, and she's not feeling that. And she's very worried, because she, and she also is noticing that um, her baby, Alexa, is eating all the time, every hour. And even though she's eating all the time, she's really, really hungry which tells you that something is going on, right? Milk hasn't come in most likely. She has not hit lactogenesis too. Another clue here, baby is very, very hungry, even though she's at the breast very frequently. And her losha, which is the blood flow after birth, is, is very heavy. And so um, C is correct. What's going on is most likely there were some placenta fragments that were not removed, all removed from the uterus, which did um, delay lactogenesis too. I'd like to end with this short video on how your body makes milk. Inside a woman's breasts are milk-making glands called alveoli. This is where your milk is made and stored. When your baby latches onto your breast and starts to suck, your brain sends hormones to the alveoli. Prolactin tells the alveoli to make milk and oxytocin tells the alveoli to release milk. This release of milk is called the letdown reflex and can take a minute or two to occur. During letdown, you may feel a tingling sensation or nothing at all. Once the alveoli release the milk, it travels through the milk ducts to your nipple. The milk comes out of the nipple openings into your baby's mouth. The more milk he takes, the more milk your body makes. It's a natural balancing act. So that was a nice video to tie things together. I also want to draw your attention to the video called Breast Anatomy and Lactation that you'll find posted on Canvas and make sure to watch that. It's a great video that will help reinforce the 
concepts discussed both in the anatomy of breastfeeding lecture as well as this online lecture on the physiology of lactation. This concludes the online lecture on the physiology of breastfeeding.